let's have our next speaker, uh, Ruth Kastner, who's going to talk about quantum mechanics and all sorts of intriguing uh, applications that we don't normally think about. And then when we're done with that, we will uh, break for lunch. I want to thank John and, and the organizers for inviting me to this really interesting conference. It's, uh, it's an unusual one for me to be able to attend. Um, when he invited me, I was uh, at first a little, you know, not sure that that my work was going to fit in all that well with what, what you guys are focused on, but it's been really fun and, and I've really learned a lot. Um, uh, I'm going to, obviously, now I probably have too many slides and I'm probably just going to be skimming through a lot of them. There's, I was informed there are too many words and I'm sure that's true, uh, too many words on the, on the slides. I um, also want to apologize in advance for any physicists who are, uh, you know, in the audience. Some of this may seem grossly oversimplified and I want to let you know I'm aware of that. Some of the slides are, for instance, conflating negative energy with ad advanced solutions and, you know, we, that's something that is an oversimplification just for the sake of kind of laying out the very basic picture here. Um, uh, let's see, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, make a few comments um, uh, about quantum theory. What, what on earth, you know, why should we be talking about quantum theory in, a, in the science fiction theme? Well, in some cases, science fact can be stranger than science fiction. And quantum theory is, is one of those theories that often seems that way. Um, what I'm going to be talking about briefly today is, is an approach that I think allows us to make some sense out of quantum theory uh, without resorting to certain kinds of what I think are, are hand wavy attempts to kind of explain away some of the mysteries and paradoxes. I think this is a way to gain some insight into, into these issues. So let's just kind of, uh, this is a very uh, wordy little abstract that I won't really waste time on right now, since we're a little pressed for time, um, and just kind of focus on, on this main issue here that the transactional interpretation, which is what I'm going to talk about, it, it's an interpretation of quantum theory. Uh, quantum theory it is a theory that's needed to predict the behavior of very small particles, such as atoms, electrons, photons, and so on. Um, it, as some of the other speakers have already noted, it works very well, but what it actually tells us about reality is very unclear. So the, the idea of interpreting the physical theory is to try to make clear what the theory tells us about reality. So just a quick overview of some of the major quantum puzzles, the so-called measurement problem, and I'll be talking a little bit more about these the probability rule for outcomes of measurements, which is called the Born Rule, named after Max Born. This a thing called non-locality. Um, in fact, John just referred to it in his last question to, to David Brin, that we, have, we seem to have influences that seem to travel faster than light. Um, also, uncertainty of properties, the, the well-known Heisenberg uncertainty principle, this is also related to non-locality in the sense that, for instance, if you have some kind of a quantum system and you've been able to ascertain its position, its momentum is completely uncertain, and vice versa, if you know its momentum to a very high degree of accuracy, then you have no idea where it is, and in a sense, it's kind of spread out all over the place, so it's, in that sense, it's non-local. So these are some of the puzzles that, that quantum theory presents to us. The first one I'm going to talk about a little bit, the, the measurement problem. So just at a very um, basic level, we, when we have a quantum system, we describe it by a quantum state. So let's just call that quantum state Q. Um, now suppose we want to find out where some sort of a quantum object, such as an electron, is. And suppose it can, we can produce this electron so that we know it is in some sort of a state called Q. But this state, in general, doesn't necessarily correspond to any well-defined position. So suppose it's created, this electron is created in some state, Q, that could be found in, in that means, the state basically means it could be in, in a number of different possible positions that we could think of as boxes that we could open. Well, what quantum theory will do is it just gives us probabilities for finding the system in, in any of these positions. It just gives us these, these probabilities that, in this case, it looks like, you know, the probability that it's in A, given that it was prepared in this state Q. 
So, but quantum theory does not give us an answer for why we only f ever find a single outcome when we actually do a measurement. So that's kind of part of the measurement problem. Um, so this idea of having some uncertainty about where this particle is um, can, be, can be referred to as being in a superposition. So the idea is that this quantum state Q means that the system is in a superposition of different possible outcomes, boxes, or, or places that we could detect the particle at. And so that um, if we do a measurement on it, we just have this set of possible places. And quantum theory does not tell us where the particle actually is. Just gives us a sort of a superposition. So um, Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, one of, the, one of the brilliant founders of quantum theory, pointed out how he was really troubled by this. And he pointed out with this model, this graphic sort of um, illustration of a cat, that, that it can get pretty ridiculous. So the way it gets ridiculous is that you have, you'd start with a quantum system that um, certainly at, a, at the non-relativistic level in an approximate sense, you have an atom, an unstable atom that can be described as being in a quantum superposition of decayed and undecayed, meaning that, that this unstable atom, it, there's no fact of the matter about whether it has sent out some decay products from its nucleus or whether it has not yet done that, so that we can model that by saying it's in a superposition. So he said, let's put this in a box with a Geiger counter, a, a vial of poison gas, and a cat. I mean, clearly, I guess he wasn't a cat lover. Um, so we close the box, and we wait for one hour. And of course, this experiment has never actually been done with a cat. So, I mean, And of course, according to the transactional interpretation, the cat would never be in a superposition anyway, but we'll get to that. Um, so the idea is if the atom does decay, then it sends out an electron it detected by the Geiger counter, breaks the vial of gas and kills the cat. And if not, then, you know, the cat's fine at the end of the hour. But so the usual problem, and according to the usual way of, of approaching quantum theory, is that what we get is this giant chain of, uh, if I can get my little laser here, um, We've got this giant quantum state that picks like a train engine. The decayed atom is like the train engine that picks up these train cars along the way. So all these other objects are like train cars that keep getting added to the engine and, and corresponding to whatever would happen for the atom. So if the atom's decayed, the, the Geiger counter is in its triggered state, the vial is in its broken state, the cat is in its dead state, but we still have this superposition of the other possibility, which is that the atom is not yet decayed and that the Geiger counter is untriggered, the vial is still intact, and we've got a live cat. And so the idea is that the cat is in a superposition of alive and dead, along with a lot of um, other macroscopic objects and that are in these superpositions of contrary situations. But we never see this. You know, we always see one thing or the other. So that's called the measurement problem. The measurement problem is that quantum theory doesn't seem to let us have any reason to think that a measurement has happened and that we end up with these crazy superpositions in principle that we never ever see. So, um, the, and I'm calling that the usual inadequate way of thinking because the transactional interpretation remedies this. So, so, but the usual inadequate way of thinking just kind of says that the quantum state collapses for some reason, uh, but it cannot account for how or why any measurement is ever completed. Sometimes it depends on an, an observer, but it cannot define what an observer or even what an observation is. So this is the measurement problem. It's just really a disease of the standard way of looking at quantum theory. Um, now what the transactional interpretation does is that it can actually define measurement and, and the term measurement is even kind of laden with this idea that some guy, you know, a girl, some lady, you know, in a lab coat, somebody in a lab coat has to come in and say, I want to measure something, I'm a person, I'm conscious, and, and you know, consciousness comes into it, and all this, these kinds of extraneous ideas that do not need to come into the picture at all. So the idea is that you can actually define a process that yields a definite outcome without but bringing in these, these ideas about someone wanting to know something and intent and that sort of thing. And what you get out of, out of TI is that so-called measurement or really just determinacy of an outcome does occur upon absorption, 
which is also annihilation of the quantum state. And that's a thing that really happens. It's a real physical process that it can uh, be, be accounted for in the theory, but it is not taken into account in standard approach to the theory. And, and it isn't taken into account par partly because it's really a relativistic process. So, so in other words, absorption involves having to take into account the, these high speed, high energy processes that in quantum theory and physical theory correspond to creation, particle creation and destruction. And in quantum theory, you only really get those processes described at the relativistic level. You don't get them at the non-relativistic level. Um, so let's just do a quick and dirty little overview of relativistic quantum theory. Um, in, in the relativistic uh, domain of the theory, you do have to take into account creation and annihilation of quantum states. And so just um, in, in a rough notation here, if we say that if we take the so-called vacuum state as a state where there are no particles that correspond to that particular kind of quantum field that you're dealing with, be it photons or electrons or something else. So suppose you don't have any of those to start with. This little guy is sort of being a creation operator. It's a, it's a sort of a dynamic process that operates on this state of no particles to give you a quantum state so that, so that it actually literally creates a quantum state. And this is what corresponds to emission at the relativistic level. And similarly, quantum states can be destroyed through the action of destruction operators. And these are parts of standard relativistic quantum theory. So these destruction operators operate on the quantum state Q, there's our destruction operator, that takes it away and leaves you with, with no quanta of, those, of that state. So this is what absorption is. It's already a real physical process. And it's just that the usual way of interpreting the theory doesn't take these processes into account. So, uh, so the idea is that ordinary non-relativistic quantum mechanics typically just kind of takes creation, emission for granted and ignores destruction of, of quantum states. And it also assumes that energy is always positive. But the transactional interpretation says that we must take destruction or absorption of quantum states into account to understand measurement. But absorption involves negative energies. This is where there's a, a, super, um, a oversimplification here because at the relativistic level, you have to kind of distinguish between what are called advanced states that propagate, they seem to propagate backward in time. Um, so often you can use negative energy and backward in time propagation interchangeably. Technically, they are distinct. But also, the backward in time propagation is what makes a lot of people kind of throw up their hands and go, oh, I'm not comfortable with this, okay? So that's, that's one of the roadblocks to considering the transactional picture. Now, later, I'm going to try to, I know we're already over time, so try to go through this very quickly. Um, my approach to this transactional picture does not have these um, processes literally traveling backwards within space-time. It's, it's a more subtle thing. So, um, but just a quick idea here with, with the transactional picture is that we have our usual quantum state, which is called an offer wave that propagates in the usual way, positive energy going forward in time. And in general, it's going to have components and different little components that will be reaching different absorbers. So you have to take into account that there are entities out there that can, these are really just other atoms that can absorb, say, a photon, a photon with energy. So um, it's, this is the part that is not part of standard quantum mechanics. So this, the, the transactional picture says that these absorbers actively respond with these conformations that are characterized by negative energy or, or more explicitly their advanced solutions that, that are, t are past directed rather than future directed. So these are conformations. Then you have an interaction of the offers and the confirmations. These are like handshakes. So if any of you are also familiar with John Kramer's work, this is based on, on John Kramer's work. And he has um, a, a book that he came out with recently that talks about the handshake kind of picture. So this is why it's called a transaction. Now, when you have these different absorbers in play, and you have one photon coming from 
the emitting atom. Only one of these, these potentially absorbing atoms can really receive that. So this is where we get a kind of a collapse. It's a real thing that happens. And say this middle one is the only one that corresponds to the case where the photon really did get actualized as a real quantum of, of energy that really does go from that emitter to that one absorber. Okay, so in a sense, these guys participated, but they didn't win. It's like a lottery. Okay, so they were there. They contributed to the to this sort of lottery competition, but they but the one in the middle is the only one that won, and that corresponds to the kind of quantum collapse to one particular outcome. So in the transactional picture, this is a real process. It really occurs. It doesn't involve having to invoke some outside observer with consciousness and so on. It's simply a process that occurs all the time. Uh, for instance, with, with my laser here, I, I don't have, <laughs> here's my little red dot, okay? So, so I've got, this is the emitter. We've got a bunch of uh, potential absorbers in this screen. They're all participating at, at a subtle level. And you see where that dot ended up? That's, that's the winning transaction. So, so we, it's a two-way street. We've got, we've got our little emitter here in my hand but we've got the screen participating, it's actively participating to create, to, to help actualize that photon. Actually, you know, with that a dot that size, we've got, you know, millions of photons. But just to kind of, you know, show you that, that this is a real physical process. There's no measurement problem here. There, there's no case where the screen is being entangled with, you know, everything else in the room and you need decoherence to tell you why you get an outcome, which doesn't really work anyway. So there's, there's actual measurement going on all the time, whenever you have photons going from one thing to another. So that's how that works. Uh, so, so TI solution to the cat problem is, is that you get absorbers in the Geiger counter. Those are just atoms. They, they really are engaged and responding in the way that uh, absorbers respond. A transaction may occur with a well-defined probability during the time the box is closed. And if it does occur, the cat dies. If it does not, the cat lives. So in this case, you have probabilities that characterize at any particular time whether you're going to get that, that little unstable atom decaying or not. And you get, when it does decay, the, Geiger, the atom in the Geiger counter really, abs really absorbs it physically. That's where the collapse happens. And end of story. So you never get this long train of other objects entangled with a quantum state. You don't get this giant superposition. So that, you know, that's basically your solution to the measurement problem. Th this has been around since 1986, um, since when uh, John Kramer first came out with his transactional interpretation. And it's, for historical reasons, it's just been neglected. Um, and, you know, we don't, I won't go into that too much here, but happy to discuss that with any of you who are interested in the history of why this is, you know, people are a little bit allergic to it, they're a little uncomfortable with it, but it, it really does solve the measurement problem. So that's something to think about. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just, just some other considerations here. It's still fundamentally uncertain as to whether a given transaction will occur or not. And so quantum mechanics does suggest that nature is indeterministic at a fundamental level. But it does give us a way to calculate the probabilities that various outcomes will occur. And of course, in the transactional picture, you get a reason for, you get a description of measurement as a physical process, and you, you get um, an end to these kinds of macroscopic superpositions that characterize the measurement problem. So you still have the fundamental indeterminacy, but that's a, that now becomes something that, that is, doesn't propagate into superpositions. It's simply, you know, a kind of um, an uncertainty as to which of your transactions will, will actualize. So um, this I'm kind of going into a little more detail here that it just tells you uh, the, the transactional picture will actually give you a reason for why you get these, the form of the probabilities that you do get in quantum theory that we already have. This is called the Born rule, okay? Um, now if I continue on here, these, these probabilities in TI there's a physical reason for their form because it expresses the interaction with the, of the offer wave and the confirmation wave, which is its complex conjugate. So the, this is the, the TI gives you the only physical account 
of this probability rule, um, which was discovered by Max Born more or less by accident. I mean, he, it's in a footnote in his 1931 paper where he originally said, I think that you know, Q, the wave function amplitude, is the probability. And then later in a footnote, he said, oh, no, no, wait, I have to square it. You know, if I don't square it, I don't get a right, the right kind of number. And that, that's how we came up with, that's how, you know, the Born rule was arrived at. In, in TI, you get a real physical reason for why it has the form that it does. So it's no longer just an educated guess by a smart guy. Okay, um, this is just a technical detail for those of you who want to see a little bit more clearly how we get... Um, out of these, these partial sorts of offers and confirmations, we end up getting a real valued full strength wave that goes from the emitter to the absorber. So, so the fine print here is that the emitter, both the emitter and the absorber are actually generating time symmetric fields that are only half strength and they're also complex. So the emitter's kind of going partly into the future, partly into the past, so is the absorber, partly into the future, partly into the past, and they are superimposing here in such a way that between the emitter and the absorber, we get a real valued field, but beyond, to the word, the past of the emitter, everything cancels out, and toward the future of the absorber, everything cancels out. So this is a nice, elegant, physical picture of how, given the kinds of fields being generated, by the emitter and by the absorber. We actually end up seeing what we want to see, what we do see, is real energy propagating from the emitter to the absorber. So that's sort of some of the technical details of how that works. So, so just the, um, the newer way that, that I like to interpret this picture is that these offer and confirmation waves, these, confer these quantum systems, actually do not exist in space space and time. That's another, you know, kind of sounds crazy, but if you look at their physical description, they're, they are described by complex Hilbert space objects that have many more dimensions than three plus one space time. And since they're complex, also, again, space time is just the, the realm of real valued quantities. So the idea is that these are possibilities that can give rise to space-time events. And the way to just picture this is that these are our quantum objects, and, and the space-time phenomenal realm is just the tip of the iceberg, really. So, and it's these transactions that give rise to our space-time events. So, uh, just a quick look of, of how to think about that. We can think of about it as kind of a knitting process, so that our quantum objects are really like, our, like yarn. They're, they're, they're very fluid, they're very sort of ephemeral, um, but that they gain structure when we knit them into um, this kind of, the space, the, you know, metaphorically speaking, space-time fabric. So, so if we see space-time as the result of these actualized transactions, then we can see that space-time is coming out as an emergent process. Um, so, so future avenues of research are to kind of see if um, the description of that, that Paul Wesson came up with, I was made aware of this by, by John, that um, he has a, an interesting 5D relativity theory that in, in many ways recovers standard uh, results of, of special and general relativity in an elegant way. And, and you get that by seeing your, your three plus one space time as embedded in a, in a larger real physical structure. And it could be that you know, what I'm seeing as this, uh, this quantum realm that is somehow outside of our usual three plus one space time is, is um, in a sense what could be described by that extra dimension that, that Wesson and his coworkers are, are exploring. So uh, with synergy, the, the possible way forward is that we don't have to be afraid of quantum non-locality. We can think of it as a possible resource. Um, the counter, a counter example to the, a lot of people kind of want to say, oh, you know, we never really see non-locality, so let's just say it doesn't really exist and let's try to explain it away 
Rather than do that, say, no, we actually do see non-local phenomena, and, and for instance, in Bose-Einstein condensate phenomena, we, you know, superfluidity, the fact that you are seeing macroscopic uh, systems that are climbing out of defying gravity and climbing out of their containers, that's in a sense, that's real quantum non-locality. So the, you know, the bottom line is we do not have to be limited by standard paradigms about what is knowable or possible. And we all remember, you know, that one, you know, if man went to fly, he'd have wings. Well, you know, so we, we can get beyond that and uh, think outside the box. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here. Thanks for listening.